Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this episode of the Mindful Muslim Podcast. On this episode, I will be speaking to the amazing Zainab. She shares her experience of OCD and gives us a real education and lots of knowledge and information and her ex- personal experience of OCD as well as religious OCD as well as relationship OCD. I hope you find this episode a really useful one inshallah. Zainab, thank you so much for joining me today on the Mindful Muslim Podcast. How are you? I'm good, Alhamdulillah. Thank you. How are you? I'm very well. Lovely to see you. I have a bit of a cold. I'm recovering though, so it's all good. Um, should we Should we just kick off? Introduce yeah, yourself sure, to our Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm Zainab. I uh, volunteer slash work for the Lantern Initiative um, and I work for How You Peterborough um, and a part of that is Lantern Initiative work. And uh, yeah, I have OCD, <laughs> so that's why I'm here. <laughs> Amazing, thank you for diving straight in, I really yeah. appreciate that. Um, uh, I think uh, I'd love to start with, with your experiences. So so OCD, I know you've also had experiences with r- religious OCD mm-hmm. in particular. Maybe just give us your understanding of, first of all, what OCD is, what religious OCD is, and then another branch of that, which we spoke about off camera. It would be great if you could tell us your understanding of all of those and then move into your experiences of each one that would be mm-hmm. super helpful yeah sure um uh so ocd is um obsessive compulsive disorder so it's when someone has um the obsessive intrusive thoughts and uh, i think a common misconception is that uh well i think people everyone has intrusive thoughts mm. but the difference is is that someone with ocd has them obsessively and it causes a, a great deal of distress right. it just makes you feel really uncomfortable so is it that repetitive nature like it won't stop it just goes on and on yeah and on. it's um it's just something it's like a monkey chattering in the background it's just com- like always there um i see mm-hmm. it almost like a bully it's just always taunting you mm-hmm. so it's just then it is really uncomfortable constant mm-hmm. yeah and then the difference is is that someone with OCD will have a compulsion, they'll want to do something about it. They'll feel the urge to do something to get rid of it. Right. Um, so everyone has intrusive thoughts, um, mm. but OCD is obviously very different. And someone has to do something and it's very uncomfortable. Mm. So do you mean with, uh, with let's say, intrusive thoughts that uh, people have that haven't had this diagnosis of OCD, they don't feel an urge to act upon the intrusive thought is that the difference yeah so uh okay so for example everyone's had the thought okay i, I don't know i mean i have i don't know people who have like oh you know like what if i just punch this person <laughs> yeah that, you know when yeah. they're talking yeah <laughs> and everyone's had some kind of weird thought or like what if i just jump in front of this train but a person with ocd mm. is will genuinely question and interrogate that thought they'll look into like, why am I having this thought? And it will cause them a great deal of distress and they almost mm. want to figure it out. Mm. And they'll all, like, want to do something about it. So they might have a compulsion. Um, and that's where uh, like the um, other behaviors come in. They might want to check, they might want to research, they want to ask for reassurance. Like, am I actually, uh, you know, do, uh, do I actually want to com- cause harm to other people and things like that? And they'll question themselves. And that's where the difference is. Most people can just ignore an intrusive thought because everyone has them but mm, yeah mm. that's the difference right right and then delving into religious OCD mm-hmm. um uh, for you I mean did you have sort of those intrusive thoughts that became OCD first and then did it come to the religious aspect or h- how did you how was your experience um so it's a really good question because um I didn't realize I had religious OCD until way later so mm. I didn't realize I had these almost quirks. <laughs> mm. I thought they were just part of who I was. Mm. Um, and um, I believe it just started out behaviorally. I had thoughts and it caused me anxiety. And I thought, okay, um, let's just, let's just, I guess, do go along. So for example, um, wudu, it actually took me um, ages. I mean, like half an hour to 40 minutes to do wudu. Mm-hmm. And 
I just thought, oh, that's really weird, but I just need to be thorough and I mm. need to be, I need to make sure that I'm actually really clean. Mm. Um, but that was when I was about 14, so it started when I was a teenager. Mm. I didn't have a name for it, so I just thought, oh, I guess it just, it's just me, it's just weird. Um, and uh, my friends thought it was strange, but we weren't educated on OCD and I had no word for it. Mm. Um, and it would cause a great deal of distress because I'd be so frustrated if I couldn't make sure that I was clean. Mm. So um, it was only until later when I had relationship OCD that I got unofficially diagnosed. And I see. Um, yeah, I don't actually know what came first. I don't know how yeah. it started, but I know mm. that I had um, quirks where I would uh, triple check or like check a lot the taps, the I would just check that they were closed mm. and um, I would do it really tight just to make sure there wasn't a drop coming out mm-hmm. um, and yeah um, I would check her go downstairs and come back up and be like oh I didn't do that and then I'll check yes. again yes. Um, or things like biting the inside of my mouth until it felt right so it would mm. cause harm but I'd, I just wanted to feel like uh, I'd it felt right on one side and on the other, and it's really weird. Mm. So I'd bite one side and I'd like, oh, no, no, it doesn't feel right, and I'll do the other. And mm. yeah, it was it was really strange, but mm. I just thought, oh, it's just, I just need to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So what was that journey towards um, you actually getting that diagnosis? I mean, was it something where you thought actually, were there particular habits like you're talking about that really got you thinking about maybe this isn't... Um, normal perhaps is that what what kind of triggered you thinking Mm. I need to see what's going on with me where were you in your life in your life at that point so there was a long journey between the religious OCD and then the relationship OCD Mm -hmm. so uh, it was about 10 years so religious OCD began as those um, compulsions of making sure that I was clean Um, But then it also turned into religious doubting. So Mm -hmm. I became an obsessive doubter about the beliefs I held. Mm -hmm. So religious OCD is all about attacking. Well, it's different for everybody, but you could be obsessed about um, not going to hell. And you'll want to make sure you're doing everything right so that, you know, you're not going to hell, you're not committing a sin. Mm. So a lot of that was about my obsessions were around that and um, belief. I had a lot of religious doubts and it makes it hard to enjoy religion. So I actually left religion. I left Islam at some point and then I came back <laughs> about um, when I was about 20. Mm. So then after that, it was relationship OCD. And that's when it became extremely distressful because OCD shapeshifts throughout mm. your life. So it changes themes according to what your well it's kind of almost random but it's what you value at Mm. that point and what you really really what's really important to you so at that time I was looking to get married to my now husband and it popped up and uh, I was uh, distressed every single day I was crying a lot and I couldn't function at work I couldn't work I was distracted I was compulsively checking my feelings for him and if this was normal if this was right Mm. and if you know we were a good match and I would question Mm. it incessantly and he I was also very honest with him that I was having these feelings but I didn't have a name for it Mm. so that's when I thought um I looked up I looked at my symptoms obviously because that's what you do when you're distressed you Mm. compulsively check and then as I was checking I I, I saw the term ROCD right and then I thought, oh, that's weird. I don't know, it says OCD in it. I don't think I have OCD. Mm. And I looked at all of the like um, symptoms and signs, and I thought, actually, that is everything. That everything I do is that. Yeah. <laughs> and then I tried to seek help for. Um, I tried to get a therapist because it was really bothering me that I couldn't figure out if I actually wanted to marry my husband. Mm. <laughs> and I. Um, couldn't find anybody that knew much about relationship OCD in the UK as struggling and so I actually looked at um, this US um, organization called NOCD it's N-O-C-D and I ended up getting um, an official diagnosis from there and then getting therapy so exposure response prevention therapy um, with the therapist. Wow so so, so like you said it 
took quite a few years for hey, you to, yeah. to to come to that conclusion or it sounds like uh, almost a mm-hmm. self-diagnosis in a way where yeah you look those up um so what was that therapy like then how, how did you start how did it help you um it was yeah it was it was great usually I would go to um I would say obviously these are my experiences mm. and I kind of want to say a disclaimer like obviously it's going to be different for everybody you should always seek professional not like professional help um and um I um the therapist was like, great she just explained that I think this is what it is because you're I, I think it was at, at that point it was pretty obvious mm. <laughs> um because I couldn't do anything but do my compulsions at that point and wow. I, it was impacting my work so I'd get emails from like work like oh you know you've slipped up a little bit and I was like I don't know what's going on with me I'm just really struggling um and um yeah, she diagnosed me and then we went through what the therapy would be. So exposure mm-hmm. response pre- prevention. And um, she explained that we would be go- exposing yourself to the, the, the triggers and the things that do make you feel distressed. So mm-hmm. we created an almost pyramid. So it started off with something relatively small, um, like looking at a picture of my hus- like now husband. Mm-hmm. And... Excuse me. Like a few seconds. It's okay. <coughs> Thank you. Um, and looking at that for a bit. Okay. That was like number one because it's easy and okay. it won't cause that much distress. Mm. And the point was, if you look at it, usually looking at it will trigger you and it will trigger some thoughts mm. and you'll end up spiraling again. Um, and so you would do that with a therapist and then you'd also then build, you'd go on to the next one. So you might have built this, you'll bit, you have, you'd have built this hierarchy of things that you find distressful on a, on a scale of one to ten. And obviously, the higher you go, the like the more, more intense. stressful it is. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I actually can't remember what the top. I probably was. Um, I actually can't remember what was at the top of mine. It's a couple of years ago now. Um, but yeah, just uh, you just work your way up with therapist, and then eventually you'd self manage. So you would do that on your own. So she'd mm-hmm. give me homework. She'd get me to write prompts. So. Um, for example, a lot of the thoughts that I had around uh, marriage uh, were like, what if I get divorced? And then what if we're not right? And that, you know, I can do everything. Mm. I can I can check everything beforehand mm. to avoid getting divorced, <laughs> which isn't likely. Yeah, you just have to you just have to roll with it. Mm. <laughs> you just to see where it goes. Um, but I was like, if I can be one hundred percent certain, because it's all about certainty and control. Mm-hmm. If I can just control everything I'll be fine and I won't get divorced I'll, I'll be fine so the prompt mm. was okay imagine actually things just don't work out mm. and that's really just stressful at the time wow, yeah, because yeah. you're you know you're already you're in the thick of it uh, and you're like okay um imagine it doesn't work out you end up like I don't know we'll see where that goes and you obviously she's there to make sure that if it does get too anxiety inducing mm. that she's there to help calm that down yes um but you end up writing this prompt and you might get silly with it and you might you might just run with it, and you have to embrace the fear of doing the thing that you're afraid of, um, and it helps to. The more exposure you have, the the less anxiety that you will feel over time, which is the principle of that therapy. Mm-hmm. And there's a different therapy as well, um, which I realized that I think I was doing as well at the time, but mm. I didn't realize I wasn't doing it fresh, like with a mm. professional. Mm. Um, but that helped a lot in calming. ERP helped in calming down my anxieties um, and feeling like actually this is pretty manageable <laughs> and mm. I'm not going to lose control or mm, so is uh, ELP the other one yeah ERP was the one that I was doing which um, what so does that stand for exposure response prevention therapy oh, okay, 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 and then okay. the other one yes. is called um, acceptance and commitment mm-hmm. uh, therapy and that one I didn't get, but it's it's different for everybody. Um, but the the difference is is that ERP is like a scale, and you work through your anxieties, mm. and it becomes less distressful. Right and over then, time, I guess. Right. I mean, how, how how what was the process in terms of you time? You have to do it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how long my therapy was, but. Um, I can't remember, but I know that I, and I have to admit, I didn't do all of the homework that Mm. I was prescribed. Mm. Um, And that's just me being honest, but also I know that I should have, and it would have helped me along a lot better. And it's something that I did 
um, after marriage as well. So sure. um, mm. you, yeah, you have to do that multiple times a day, sometimes more depending on the severity as well. Yes, yes. So, if those intrusive thoughts are very much there all the time. Yeah. And you said before starting the therapy, it had got to the but point where it was compulsions all the time. All the time. It was all I could think about and mm. I would just break into, I would just burst into tears. Um, but it, yeah I just um the more that I did that the more it helped to see things a little bit more clearly so it's not always that you're gonna see you know you're gonna see things like with clarity mm. but the more that your anxiety is reduced the the more you will actually be able to feel something other than anxiety and it, it does get better but you do have to keep being persistent and you can't expect to feel something because of the therapy it will just happen eventually mm. I do believe that like I didn't um at the time I was so distressed thinking that uh like I, don't, I still don't really feel anything for my mm -hmm. partner but like I know that I don't want to leave um mm. and that was just the main thought like I don't want to leave but I feel like I should because I don't feel anything and then it was just this self-perpetuating cycle and I know that if I left it would have been it would have felt horrible I, I didn't want to mm. but I, I didn't know how to be talking to my part, like the my the someone I was thinking about getting married to, um, mm. and he was really patient, and it helped. <laughs> um, but it's it's so lonely and difficult that it's so it's so painful in that moment mm. that you just want to get out of it, and it's hard to stick with something that you don't know it's going to work. And sometimes ERP doesn't work, so you might do ACT, the acceptance commitment therapy, and that might work. But I mm. think that. Um, you can't just ignore it and you, you can't just, uh, you have to sit with it right. and you have to embrace the discomfort. Right. Um, the acceptance therapy, I, I haven't heard of that you just mentioned, acceptance and commitment, mm -hmm. but I have um, just in passing spoken to people about OCD before and things that have come to mind is like, if that intrusive thought does come into your head, try to almost wrestle with it or don't let that intrusive thought win like whatever mm. sort of act that you have that urge to mm -hmm. do try to not do it yes by yeah. by try to uh, trying to sort of whether it's education or some other form of reminding yourself that actually I don't need to wash my hands 20 times or 100 mm. times or whatever it might be mm -hmm. but I've never had that experience myself so I can't put myself in those shoes and mm. really know if that would work you know if you if you had that conversation with yourself um and like you say if it's just incessant thoughts all the time how many thoughts can you argue with and, and make sense and <laughs> yeah it sounds really 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 difficult yeah it's yeah essentially it's exhausting mm. you can't fight every single thought and mm. trying to is is so tiring and you hardly have the mental space for anything else at the end of the day um so uh and it's a good point you do just have to you do i i think fighting is almost the wrong word because you can't mm. fight you can't fight it mm. um i don't think you i think it's um it's just there and mm. you have to embrace it like accept right. it and that's the I part see. of acceptance uh, therapy I see. I see. so for example one of my um the one of the things i had to do was not triple check 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 the taps yes 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 <laughs> so i just closed it once and i had to just leave it Mm. And that was really uncomfortable because I thought, no, I, I can't do that. Um, and uh, I considered it a win when I just checked it like twice. Yeah. Um, less than before. Yeah, less than before. Mm. I was like, okay, actually, you know what, that's okay. And then I told my therapist, like, yeah, that's great. Like, and then we're going to keep working until you just don't do have it to check all. it yeah. anymore. Yeah. And yeah. you will slip up. It's not linear. That's the thing mm. with therapy. It's never linear. You are going to... Bit of a wave. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. You're going to yeah. check it a lot at some point and then check it not at all or like you just it will always go up and down mm. and then eventually you'll get to a stable point but that's the point of um erp and then i guess acceptance therapy mm. which i actually i don't know a lot about mm. um but you just have to accept that actually you know what i won't check the tap maybe that maybe they'll it'll drown maybe like you know there'll be a little flood i'll start accept it it's fine and it's silly but you just mm. it's not gonna happen you have to you have to tell yourself yeah I'll be fine with it and I'll deal with the consequences wow. and yeah. it's hard because you just want to yeah it makes you feel like it's a little bit of reassurance when you check yeah and it's temporary relief but it makes it worse right. it feeds the like it's, I say a bully it, 
prompt that like, encourages them to keep going yes 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 yeah. you're, you're you're feeding those ideas and feeding the bully if you will if you're just checking and getting that little bit of instant reassurance like you're yeah. saying which is so tempting and you just carry on yeah and actually it's for the worse in the long term yeah exactly wow. um mm. it, it just makes things um a lot harder and i think that a lot of I've seen a lot of advice, especially with regards to religious OCD, mm-hmm. that, oh, ignore it, you know, mm. and or like trust in Allah. And it's like, of course, that's a really nice thing to say, but it's not going to work. <laughs> mm. That's not going to work here. Someone has a, a clinical disorder here and they need help, professional mental health, like health help. Yes. And whilst that would, it's nice in conjunction with mm. the professional help that they mm. hopefully will be getting. Um, and like, by itself like, it might not be enough it's not going to be enough at mm. all like uh, you know or make dua and pray and likelihood is people with religious OC are compulsively praying anyway, anyway they are doing that in the bucket loads they're already praying so much they they actually just need help to sort and, of rein back the way that it's being done y- yeah or, yeah mm. because often those acts are done do, like out of the need to to make sure that they're not sinning and yes. to make sure that you're a good person yes. and um i still struggle with um elements of religious ocd mm. and it's obviously alhamdulillah i've come back to islam i'm back to islam i don't think i ever really left but um i've come back to it properly and i'm practicing now and mm. um uh, when i do wudu, i still repeat steps or in salah i still like i you know if I'm just, I have to make sure that I'm, I, it's like the right way or like mm. it's perfect. And I still think, oh, have I missed a regard here or something? And um, it's, that's difficult because it feels you, your enjoyment in prayer and anything actually just to do with religion, it sucks the joy out mm. of, and it makes you feel guilty and not good enough. And you feel like, I'm not a good. I'm not a good enough Muslim. I'm not a good. Not a good Muslim at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know this is sinful, and if I do this one thing wrong, which is my one of my um, thoughts, is if I do this thing wrong, then I'm going to hell, mm-hmm. and it's such a jump. <laughs> it's such a jump that I can't. Extremes. It's like yeah, yeah, extreme, yeah, 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 and it yeah. is this black and white thinking mm-hmm. that um, constricts us, uh, and we can't really see out of it. So. Praying more, making it doesn't do anything. Um, when, it won't. when you when you're saying that you have those compulsive thoughts so often, and it's got to the stage where um, it's beyond you just being able to to sort of pray, and like you say, it's got to the stage where you're not thinking that you're good enough and a good Muslim and steps need to be taken for you to actually get proper professional help to help mm-hmm. you um yeah i can imagine that that it's it can be hard to take that sort of initial step um when you spoke about you reached out to this american organization was that something that <clears throat> you just sort of did by yourself or looking back or just advice to, to other people some of the symptoms and signs that you've described if they are going through something like this mm you know what could be the those initial steps or things that they could do to to try and get some help it would be to speak to a professional Mm. for sure I mean um I didn't want to just self-diagnose because I thought I I don't actually know and it could Mm. just be like I've never had it this intense before so maybe it's just me it's in my head and uh people who are suffering with OCD they often feel like um that help or like therapy won't work because their mm. OCD is unique. And uh, that's, that's what I thought. Like, I thought, you know what, mine's just really bad. It's not going to work. Or, um, nah, it's just my thoughts. I can work with it. You feel like you still can control it to some extent, but you can't. And it's, I think you just end up blaming yourself, which you can prevent getting therapy. But I would say definitely speak to a professional. And I only did, I only did that with the American organization because they had more knowledge about mm. relationship OCD. Yes. And it's more known there. And I thought, right. okay, they're going to understand it better. Mm-hmm. Um, and she is a professional, so I thought, okay, she's diagnosed me. I didn't want to go to a UK doctor, but that was, you know, I, I still should get diagnosed officially here. Um, but um, for anyone who does feel like they have those symptoms, definitely um, go see a professional. And yeah. I think, yeah. And I finding, especially with religious OCD, I think advice from imams or anyone scholars any religious people it's 
I wouldn't, that's not my first port of call. It's Mm -hmm. in conjunction and often they don't say the right things because they're not aware of mental health as, I mean, OCD is very misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So often the wrong advice might be given. They might think, okay, I just need to pray harder. Right. Make more dua and I'll be okay. And it's no, you need professional Mm. help. Mm -hmm. And from the mental health realm. Of course, like these particular therapies. Yes, yes. Yes, because often the advice is is contradictory to the advice given in therapy. Yeah, I mean, off the back of that, what what you've mentioned about misconceptions, what do you think those big misconceptions are? Have you come across any that have sort of just talking to people anecdotally? What have, what are those misconceptions that people hold about OCD? Um, I think more, uh, an annoying misconception is that it's mostly about cleaning. Mm. <laughs> I know when people say, mm. everyone's heard someone say, oh, I'm so OCD. <laughs> like, uh, like, you know, in, in, in reference to cleaning. Mm. And that is so annoying. Um, and um, I usually let them say it just because I just think, okay. And I should correct them. I do, you mm. know. But I think I just uh, think, okay, well, okay. It is, it's socially acceptable to say that, unfortunately. You see here in films and things all the time. Mm. Um so yeah, cleaning, um, and there's so many different, there's so many different themes of OCD, uh, and I, people have no idea. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I haven't come across any personally, mm-hmm. um, but I, I've known, uh, I know not to really open up where it can, so for example, with relationship OCD, if I said that to someone who didn't understand OCD, they'd mm-hmm. say, leave your partner, or like, leave they're not right for you clearly if you're having doubts Mm -hmm. you know okay and I didn't want to hear it I didn't want to hear that because I knew that deep down I actually wanted to be with this person right so um someone who doesn't know about OCD Mm -hmm. might listen to that and think oh clearly you're like you know you don't want this or um at the time of religious OCD when I was going through it it was oh like you know you're you just don't know anything about like Islam enough or mm. and it's actually like no that's it's a natural disorder that affects the brain there's nothing that it's not your fault and no one ever said that um but I think those misconceptions are like it's your it's in your control it's your choice people think that it's something maybe that can be helped and it's it can be helped with professional help mm. <laughs> um and yeah yeah um I can imagine that can be so damaging if you're just sitting with a friend or a family member and you mention some of these things um it can be really damaging to sort of your journey to wellness mm. um you know if you hear things like that but it's obviously from you know like we said misconception a lack of education in that realm or um you know OCD in terms of Mm. diagnosis has been around for a while but actually what what do you know we know about it generally just in society it's very very Mm. uh lacking I I guess really yeah like you said so many themes what are some of those themes if you could share with us just to broaden our horizons a little bit yeah sure um so it's like um going from harm OCD so um having obsessive thoughts about harming yourself Mm. or harming others um, so someone might think if I count to a hundred before my mum comes home, she'll be safe, you know. Um, and uh, that's just someone a thought that someone might have, and they'll do that because <laughs> they feel that that's the only reason their mum is safe. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, or um, there's um, homosexual OCD as well, so compulsive thoughts about being gay. Mm. Um, so you might look at someone of the same sex, you think, oh, they're attractive, and you're like, oh, actually, I'm a gay, and uh, you just you you keep thinking about it, and then you end up questioning your sexuality. Um, there's um, uh, I'm trying to think of symmetry OCDs, having everything in symmetrical order, um, cleanliness, of course, contamination, um, um, paedophilia OCD, where you are concerned that you might be a paedophile because you looked at a child and you think, oh, they're a cute kid, and then you might question your character. And these are the things that people keep quiet because it's so. If you say that to someone, they might think, actually, you're really weird. <laughs> Why would you have that thought? Mm, mm, mm. And that's very normal with someone, they, like, who's, with someone who has OCD. Mm, um, and mm. they need more compassion and understanding. And I think it's the onus of people who don't have OCD to try and understand that. Right. And, um, right. and to ask questions. To really. ask, exactly. Like, like the OCD attacks what you value. So mm. because you value not harming others, because you hold that to such a high regard, it will attack it. It'll actually wow. turn it, <laughs> turn it around on you. So, um, 
it attacked for me it was religious identity because Islam is so important to me it's mm. the most important thing in my life mm. so it attacks that and then relationship because if a partner's the half your half your dean it's the most important thing so um second most important thing and um it'll attack that because it's so important to you um so it's actually the opposite of who you are and your values so I think people think that perhaps the thoughts that you have are the reflection of your character and I think that's the onus of people to understand that it's not it's not that and these people don't want these thoughts which is why it's causing them such great distress yeah um so yeah loads of themes thank you I mean that's definitely yeah. broadened my horizons for sure <laughs> um I think just because um like you say what's there sort of in the public eye and we th- we see in films or newspapers or you know just general reading it's going to be um the cleaning OCD that comes up all the time yeah um, I do wonder if those were the ones that were I don't know diagnosed first or we knew about them most or they're more spoken about like you say and people who might be really struggling with actual OCD but having a sort of different theme mm. that you've mentioned yeah. just don't talk about it and they just struggle it's not as palatable as cleaning because when people say oh I'm so OCD it's mm. almost like they're trying to compliment themselves like I'm so clean um, and people with OCD, actually, it's obviously a very different thing. Um, it's just more palatable. No one wants to portray paedophilic OCD. No one wants to talk about that because obviously it's, it, it sounds horrible, but it's not. It's just someone suffering with these thoughts. Um, and yeah, it's just not palatable enough. Mm. I think that's what it is. Wow. Um... Let's move on a little bit sure. um, in terms of uh, after your diagnosis, after your therapy. Um, you mentioned that it helped a lot. Mm-hmm. It would be good to sort of, um, I think, delve a little bit more into that. You spoke about the doing things less and less over time. Is there anything else that you wanted to share about specific memories or, or situations where you were doing sort of, or you had this compulsive thought before and over time it, it seemed to get better with all of the effort that you were making, by the way, it sounds like it's a journey and it's a process and it's mm-hmm. a lot of e- effort and homework, like you were saying on your part. Mm-hmm. Are there any other kind of uh, things that you could share in terms of what improvements you saw in yourself? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. It's is it a, hard to think about them now or remember them a, because you're so sort of in the wellness <laughs> bit now you know in terms of it's feeling because, good yeah I mean I don't take 40 minutes to do wudu mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's mm-hmm. a great mm-hmm. win but that's because things changed as I got older um but I I do still worry about um cleanliness in wudu mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I, I do still battle those thoughts uh, I say battle but I still mm-hmm. do try and work with them and uh sometimes I try to accept that this is the end. Like yeah. I, I've, I've done it, now I'm going to walk away. But I still I still fail at that, and I think mm. that's the... Even though I am way out of, actually, the main distress and the... Yes. Like the, you know, I was in a really deep anxiety and uh, depressive bout, but I'm mm. out of that, but I still struggle with these thoughts, and mm. um, I think it's important for people to know that it doesn't just go away and you just work with them, and obviously the more skills you learn, the, the, the better... Like, in your toolbox, you're able yeah. To, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I... Um, trying to think of specific examples mm. and I mean the the tap one was a big thing for me I don't mm. do that anymore and I mm. used to do that after marriage as well so bef- after I had the therapy I used to men I used to leave um I um you said to my husband oh I just need to check the taps mm. and he'd be like okay that's fine mm-hmm. um and uh mm. usually you ideally you wouldn't be encouraged to do that and um like um, this is a different conversation, mm. but um, I think it's important to know your triggers yeah. and then to communicate that to people. Right. So, um, yeah, learning um, what your triggers are and then people want to give you reassurance, but actually mm. that's actually really bad for OCD. You shouldn't get reassurance. But um, mm. So, for example, I'm trying, I can think of relationship examples because that one was more recent, I think, and a lot more distressful. Um, but I used to... Um, uh, um, seek reassurance from like my best friend I was like he's a good guy right I mean it's a brother mm-hmm. <laughs> actually so mm-hmm. I, I used to think I used mm-hmm. to seek reassurance like oh you know like uh, like I do I do right like this is normal like mm-hmm. I do feel like this and um I used to check my feelings with her and um that was uh compulsive and I eventually learned that I shouldn't do that and my best friend would naturally want to give me reassurance and then I'd say to her actually um, don't give me reassurance, please. Um, it's worse for my OCD because uh, I'll rely on it, and mm. it's a temporary relief. It's a compulsion, 
So was it better for you not to hear, yes, you you do have, you know, romantic feelings towards yeah, this person? Yeah, it was better. And is it to allow you to make your own decision or is it just it's feeding? It's what feeding you said the OCD. Yeah, so that's the mm. compulsion. So each theme will have its different, it will look different, but it works the same way. Mm-hmm. You have your obsessive thoughts and then mm-hmm. you have your compulsions. So my religious OCD compulsions were different to the relationship ones obviously because there's a different thing mm. um so this one I used to check I used to research my feelings I used to research how what's a normal relationship like like what mm-hmm. does it look like because I, I didn't grow up with that it wasn't really around me um and then what does how does how do you how does marriage work kind of <laughs> and whilst these might look like normal questions they were compulsive I used to check every single time I had this doubt and I couldn't trust the fact that actually maybe deep down I do really want to be with this person mm. um and I'm like, we're, we're good now, we're happy mm, now, mm, um, we're fine. Yeah. But before, I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't see how I could possibly get married and be fine. Like, going to get a divorce. And it was all these, um, all these thoughts. It was almost as if I wanted to control the outcome, which mm-hmm. you can't do. And so I'd ask for assurance for my best friend. Like, you know, do you think it would work out? Do you think it's going to be okay? And she doesn't know the answer. But, you know, she'd try and reassure me. And... Um, yeah, it feeds the OCD monster a little bit and it placates it. Mm. Temporarily, it makes it feel good because it's like, yeah. And it's almost, and you know that it's terrible because you also do it. And then this is where it gets a little bit complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do it because you feel that relief. Mm. So I'd feel the relief. I'd be like, yeah, okay, that's fine. I'm making a good decision. You know, I couldn't trust myself to make that decision, but I'm like, okay, my best friend, she said it, it's fine. And then you know that you're going to keep doing it because you are hearing the answer you want to hear. So if she had said, no, I think you should leave, I'd actually get more distressed. But I really just wanted to hear it was going to be fine. Mm. But it would make it worse uh, because I'd be like coming back to that and I'd ask the same question or in a different way. I see. I'd want to check that, yes, yeah, it is still a good decision. Um, and... Mm. Uh, so for that person yeah. opposite if other I'm just thinking of our listeners and viewers for that other person involved if if this person is asking you constantly this same question mm-hmm. is the response better to say it's a decision that you need to think about or is it nobody knows the future yeah, absolutely that's it yeah mm. so it's the when if and anyone listening that has OCD it's the onus on us to understand what our triggers are mm. so what is it that we what is it that we get triggered by what is it that what is or our what are our compulsions mm-hmm. um and then communicating that to the people around you because even though it's not your fault at mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. it is your responsibility and you do have to learn about it and you do have to understand how it looks like and how it might impact the ones around you because they will just want to help you and it's for not sure. their fault if for they sure. they mean well but if you tell them hey actually you know what don't give me reassurance you know stop me from checking things like just try and help me do this and if you tell them they will do that because mm. you're telling them this is actually really good for my OCD if you do this this, this is what this. I need yeah, this is yeah, what yeah. I need it's mm. exactly it. communicating your needs and that mm. only comes with education learning about your OCD right and this is for someone who already knows they have OCD yes and obviously if you don't and you are suspecting it definitely seek help get a diagnosis but for someone who has it and doesn't know what to do learn about it learn about your triggers your compulsions find out like and if you need help with that seek get professional help with that and Mm. sometimes it's hard to see what they are when you're already um stuck in it but um, learning some, how a lot to. of times you'll need that outside perspective yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly like they're gonna how to um mm. then communicate it and that's that's brave and it's difficult but it's so important because um people who enable it and it's not their fault but mm. they all make it worse because it's temporary wow. providing relief so um i used to do that with um my um partner at the time i used to sort of be like thoughts i'm having i feel like i'm gonna this is gonna happen and that's gonna happen and what if it's like this and always you can tell an intuitive thought by the way it begins it's like what if what if what if wow, wow, wow. and it's always it's what, the if. what if questions okay <laughs> but incessantly mm. and um or the just in case like, i'll do this just in case you know mm-hmm. I'll, I'll check mm-hmm. the tap just in case mm-hmm. um but and uh, and he was always very patient always reassured me never said anything right but um it wasn't good for me because i knew that i could just i could just keep getting that reassurance and then eventually I had to stop myself 
from doing that in the first place and then yeah. over time I mean, I'd... partners are always told be patient with each other yeah. that's like a beautiful virtue you know to yeah. have in a partnership or in a marriage so I can see exactly you know what what he might have been thinking at that exactly. point but in terms of your situation that's yeah. not what you actually it's not needed. I needed it it wouldn't have helped and he wasn't to know that so of course eventually I just stopped checking as much mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. And also sort of communicating yeah. with him actually stopped me rather than reassuring me and yeah. agreeing with me or saying yes, just... Exactly. Mm. And there's no bigger exposure to wow. um, my fears and getting married. So I got married and then I was like, okay, wow, I'm still anxious, but we're doing this. Mm, mm. <laughs> but the more exposure that I had, the easier it became because obviously I was now living with him. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. well, I can't mm -hmm. escape it. And it's always here. Then I would still fall into my compulsions, but I had a better like grip on them and I mm. understood what they were and I would communicate a little bit better and they're like, That's Oh, fabulous. I'm just experiencing this and mm. I don't but I don't give me reassurance. Or yes. sometimes I would actually ask for reassurance and um that was when I slipped up. Mm. But now that I have worked through them and I have a better grasp of my uh compulsions, I have seen I don't do that anymore. I just uh, I still have it time to time like we do I do still have that mm. and we do still have those conversations but mm. I can see them clearly like a lot clearer and I know that um, what might stem from OCD could also stem from trauma right. and it's really difficult to know what's trauma what's your anxiety what's your attachment <coughs> what's your OCD and I think that's particularly with relationship OCD um, and I think with religious OCD sometimes it's because you haven't had a great time with authority figures growing up so you might not have had an Islamic background. I didn't have one, as in I wasn't. I didn't have like a teacher or something. Mm. Um, family, we didn't have like a really strong Islamic um, upbringing. So um, and then authority figures. There might be some childhood trauma or something that impacts the way that you have the relationship with uh, Allah, and then that affects that, and then that might contribute to OCD. And so it's about working with OCD so you can see all these other things clearer. Like, a lot more clearly mm. and then you can work with those things so when I realized that I had um, relationship OCD I thought okay well I know there's also some trauma stuff going on here but I can't tell what what's what mm. <laughs> so the more I worked with my OCD the more I could see actually how much of it was my own trauma and anxieties and mm. I was able to work with that as well so it's a holistic approach but when you do when you're in the thick of it you need that um, OCD therapy help you need yeah. that you need yeah. to focus on that first absolutely it sounds like from what you've described it's almost like a process of letting go of of not knowing what the future holds um and and accepting as you say almost what's in front of you or that mm -hmm. or that action is done now and I'm going to leave it at that particular thing mm -hmm. or whatever because there's so many themes that you've that you've mentioned um so I, I want to know sort of what it felt like maybe towards the end of, um, I suppose, like you say, it's, it's still very much an ongoing struggle. You know, there's intrusive thoughts now and again, there's compulsions, you know, or, or things that you'll do that you'll repeat still. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to sort of understand or I want that to know more about what's the feeling that's coming up in you when you're going towards wellness and sort of overcoming some of those things mm -hmm. you know in yourself like ha, what was it like um not having to um check the taps you know mm -hmm. as in the process um... for you like how you felt about yourself at that point oh like I felt relieved <laughs> it was uncomfortable at first mm. to not do the compulsion mm. And then just all of a sudden, I would say all of a sudden, but then I, one day I realized, actually, I don't do that anymore. And I just thought, oh, wow, okay, that's amazing. I didn't realize that. Mm. Um, it's almost like you're starving the bully and you're just letting it rot. I mean, he's letting it, you know. Mm. Um, but I, I, yeah, I just don't pay as much attention. I just didn't, one day it just didn't happen. And I was like, okay, great. Um, and you realize that it's just, I don't know how it works or really the intricacies of OCD mm. but the more you work with it the more you um embrace it to almost sit with it eventually it just 
he just goes and just disappears. Mm. And sometimes though, I might still check the tap, but it's not as um, distressing or uh, off fre- frequent yeah. um, as yeah, it used yeah. to be. Yeah, I mean, the frequency is a big aspect of it, as you say. And I think educating the people around you, knowing your triggers, it's so much about knowing yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and digging deep as well, and maybe thinking about your past as well, because you mentioned it's, like, important to have that kind of control. Um, was there anything, you know, that you feel comfortable with about your past or your childhood or your upbringing that you kind of worked with perhaps a therapist or just your own reflections mm-hmm. about? I'm just thinking possibly for parents or other relevant people listening in terms of children or younger siblings perhaps um what they could do or not do to sort of perhaps prevent OCD or uh, reduce the chances of those kind of tendencies appearing Mm -hmm. in the future See, that's a really really great question and it's not one I don't think I have a really good answer to Mm. because it really depends. I mean, it depends then on the causes of OCD, which could be genetic, you know, like biological, that could be due to upbringing. Mm. Um, and that, it's always, you just don't know. And yeah. um, in, yeah, it is more likely in people who have perfectionist tendencies, which I do have. Yeah. Um, but it would be um, learning about, I mean, if you suspect that someone in the family has OCD it's worth always learning about because mm. I think these things get passed off as quirks you know me taking 40 minutes to do wudu and mm. I think anyone expected just thought oh you're just taking ages in the bathroom mm. but I suppose if we had learned about things like that and if it was more common knowledge which meant mental health is now being talked about a lot more but you know things like ADHD and OCD still get sidelined or bipolar disorder and we mainly talk about depression and anxiety mm-hmm. but I think we need mm. to look at actually if if there is something that your child is doing or your sister or brother is doing, mm. it's worth looking at their behaviours and um, if they are distressed or... And talking what to them talking, about yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Like what mm. their thoughts might be if they are expressing that um, it does never feel clean enough to do, like when I do wudu, mm. you know, and maybe, maybe it could be as simple as that and that's definitely worth investigating um, and getting professional help for them. Um, yeah. But I don't have a good answer for that because... Yeah. Um, it it's so varied and exactly. sort of complicated as you mentioned and the layers involved um can be really tricky but um um yeah I mean for for family members parents I think I think just it it does come back to education and and yeah I think parenting is is is, is the hardest and the most important job you know <laughs> yeah. being a new parent myself it's something that I think about a lot so I think just knowing as much as we can and, and having as much knowledge can is is really is really the way forward. Um, I I wanted to ask you a slightly different question. Um, at Inspirited Minds, we recently conducted a public consultation on religious OCD, mm-hmm. um, and one of our participants mentioned that her OCD stemmed from a lack of lack of knowledge. Um, so I just about the actual religious practices themselves. Mm-hmm. So like not being sure. Um, what breaks would do yeah yeah um and really do you think that you know what what do you think that the apart from the ones that you've mentioned already are there other religious OCD kind of tendencies that you could that you could share with us because I know you also work with the um the Lantern Initiative Mm -hmm. um and some of your projects there where you may have delved into this it would Mm -hmm. be great if you brought in those experiences in terms of um what are those common signs or symptoms again for for Mm -hmm. religious OCD so um, it's a great question because um, I have found that the more I learn, the less, or I, I'm able to work with the thoughts, I say mm-hmm. work with them, but yeah, I'm able to sit with them a little bit better because I know. Um, I haven't really spoken to many people in the community about OCD or anyone mm. actually, because it's not something we, we, we're not there yet. <laughs> mm. um, and we've got quite a little bit of way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I know that, uh, I do, from what I know and from my research, I know that there's a, it's a lot around cleanliness. Mm. And uh, if I think a bad thought about God, um, I need to repent. I need to do this, I need to do that. And, go- and um, I know it's all about, like, I used to have blasphemous thoughts as well. So that was a part of it. Mm-hmm. And you're saying, oh, wow, like, 
I'm clearly not like a Muslim if I have these thoughts you start making these character judgments mm -hmm, and I think mm -hmm. people might be doing that even though it's contrary to what they actually feel about Islam and that's it's all varied as well like how it presents itself with someone um, with religious OCD um, but I, I do believe that the more knowledge that you do have the better it is mm -hmm. um, in terms of you, like if, you, if, you, if you still need therapy definitely get therapy mm. but with the tools that I do have I find that the more knowledge I have the better so I for example learning more about Istinja you know um, and we're um, remembering Allah's mercy is so important to me because I think a lot of us grew up with um, like <laughs> going to mosques where maybe they're a little bit strict um, there might have been um, beatings, there might have been lots of shouting, it wasn't kind or compassionate way to learn about the Quran or Allah, like it wasn't a great environment and I knew I, I went to one of those mosques and learning that God will punish you if you do this, you know, and it's always that really harsh framing of God and mm. you don't see him mercifully. Yeah, yeah. And now that I'm older I'm able to learn about Islam more and I know more and I'm able to have my own connection. I try and remember that that's so much more merciful than what I was taught to believe when I was younger and unfortunately that sticks and it's harder to shake off when you're older absolutely um, unless you have parents that have taught you that mm. and if you do alhamdulillah but I, I didn't have that and I think mm. a lot of people didn't have that it was often just if you do this you're going to get this and yeah subhanAllah I think there is um, often you know just so much focus on rules um, and I'm not, you know, negating how important those are, but um, especially to a child, as you say, that's really going to stick in terms of this is the uh, view mm. that I have of of my creator. Um, in terms of just, it's very black and white, and right. it's very very strict, and it's very very, you know, where's the focus on the love? Yeah, you know, that Allah is love, like, and is the most compassionate and the most merciful yeah. and the most loving, and it's just. I, I, yeah, I don't think there's enough focus on that, possibly even in households and homes, yeah, you know, and as you say, absolutely. in, in uh, religious establishments as mm. well and teaching places. Um, because, uh, I don't know, I mean, I would hazard a guess that if we did ask a group of, group of young kids about the, I don't know, a trait of Allah, I, I doubt that their first one that comes to mind would be, would be that he is the most loving or the yeah. most compassionate. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that says a lot and about our own sort of way that we're teaching our children about Islam. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely something to reflect on for sure. Um, my next question is a little bit um, actually sticking to thinking about the Muslim community. And mm. um, as we know, there's already stigma, not just within the Muslim community, but with generally with society, still really with mental health disorders or, or problems mm. or struggles that, people's, that people are fa uh, facing. Um, and do you think when it comes to religious OCD that particularly in the Muslim community, we have more of a stigma towards that? Um, perhaps because, I don't know, a fear of the unknown or mm. whatever it might be. Do you think it's more difficult to sort of maybe share that for somebody that thinks maybe I, maybe I I do have those um, tendencies or religious OCD possibly. Do you mm. think it's more difficult to share that with, with loved ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I believe so. I, it can I, be. I mean, it just depends on your situation. But Yeah, it depends on so many different factors. Mm. So how supporting, um, how supportive your family is, mm. how loving they are, if you know that, if you feel safe with them emotionally. Right. Um, if you're able to actually say that, I feel like... Um, you know, I may need to seek help, professional help. Can you say that? And for, I don't think, mm. like, I think with second generation parents, um, they are not, they didn't have the time to explore their emotions. They might not be as emotionally equipped. You might not feel as emotionally safe with them because they just had to get on with things and you've had to, you've had, you've, you've adopted that in the household. Um, you might tell your friends, but they're the same age as you and you might, they might not know anything about OCD. Um, and it really is the job of the parents and unfortunately there are a lot of people suffering out there because they haven't had that loving support from day one even um, so they might seek help from somewhere else and it really depends on who you go to because mm. we're told go to imams, go to scholars, go to uh, XYZ mm. um, 
and we didn't say actually no go to go to a therapist <laughs> you go to a therapist um who will be able to help you um especially in regards to OCD mm. and I think people are um becoming a little bit more knowledgeable but it really does just come down to knowledge because people with OCD especially religious OCD they feel so guilty they feel so guilty and that's exactly why I thought you know what if I can't be a Muslim properly I'm just not going to be a Muslim mm. and, I thought, oh. and I was young um, but people will think in, in those ways it's black and white already for them so they think okay well there's new nuance here I can't they can't think in the grey they assume okay look I just can't um, you know just I'll just leave. Oh, well, I won't. I won't pray anymore. Or they get frustrated and they won't do all that. They won't pray and then all that, and it affects everything. Mm. Um, and it's yeah, it's just so much guilt already that I think they already feel like that religious OCD is a reflection of their faith. That it's because they are a bad Muslim. Mm-hmm. So when they are faced with advice that says pray more and do this, they think okay, well I should just I need to do more. <laughs> when they don't, they just need help. Um, so it really again just comes down to education and um, mm. compassionate support and that mm. sometimes unfortunately you don't get in families you might get in friends but they won't be able to diagnose you mm. so you need to go seek help and that needs to be encouraged in schools in mosques they need to talk about it they need to talk about OCD because I do believe um, I remember reading that I think Muslims are more likely twice as likely to get OCD compared to Christian counterparts Wow. And because emphasis is on cleanliness, yes. I can see why that's exacerbated with people who have OCD because it just makes it worse. And the less they know and the less they get, obviously, if they don't get help, then it will make it worse over time. And there are so many people suffering with it. Like, and it's, it's so, it breaks my heart because help is there. It's just about directing people to that help. And mm. yeah. Yeah. Mm-mm. And just signposting, really, as well. Yeah. But it's that it's that awareness, isn't it? Just having the knowledge, and um, as you say, speaking about it in, uh, you know, different sessions, different communities, different uh, settings. Yeah, so even just um, obviously, not everyone has the opportunity to get help. The NHS mm. is obviously in a very bad state, and getting help, we have to wait a very long time, mm. or private help. They can't afford that, mm. and that is obviously a very a different matter altogether. Uh, but this is about people who give the wrong advice or don't know what to say and they say something and it's rather it's better to say actually I don't know what to do Mm. here I think we need to speak to someone that isn't a professional because imams and scholars don't know everything and that's that's just that's it and that's fine that's and that's that's okay that's not sort of a criticism it's It's just just, um, yeah trying to help that person in front of you and being completely transparent and honest about exactly about you know what what help can be given um that's amazing thank you um I guess uh we've already spoke about some of the practical ways that you deal with OCD but was there any others that you that kind of come to mind or things in your toolbox that you use day to day that help you Mm -hmm. um maybe minimize those intrusive thoughts or the compulsions and acting upon them was there anything else that you that you do sort of daily Mm, so the best uh and I think this actually comes from acceptance and commitment therapy but knowing your values so Mm. uh, this was particularly helpful with relationship OCD but knowing your values generally especially as a Muslim or as someone who wants to who's having doubts about their partner but you you say okay look um you stay value driven and your feelings regardless they will fluctuate you you might feel anxious on the wedding day you might feel anxious praying to God but you do it anyway because you know it's the right thing to do Mm -hmm. so um that's the advice that I took and I thought okay if I outline my values I know myself and mm. regardless of how anxious distressed I obviously get help but if no matter how anxiety like how anxious I get this this is what I'm going to do right so this particularly helped when you know in praying if I was really concerned about if I missed a rakat, I thought okay you know I'm just going to pray and I'm going to tell myself that Allah's more merciful than these thoughts and it's fine I'm okay and sometimes it doesn't work um, mm. but you have to embrace the fact uh, also there's a flip side to that mm. um, so stay value driven mm. but also turn OCD on its head so if this might be a little bit it could be triggering for someone to do but this is what helps and it might seem blasphemous it might be triggering but mm. um, uh, if I do 
feel like I've missed a regard and I haven't, it's just the thought, and I get stuck on it. Like, okay, so what if I've missed a regard? Okay. Mm. And you have to just go along with it, you have to accept it, and you think, okay, so what? I will like, um, so what if I did with the wrong? When you know that you haven't, you know, you've, you've been thorough, and I know that I'm thorough, but I have this feeling that I wasn't. I said, okay, so what if I wasn't? And I have to, that's good, that helped me a lot. And or like, so what if I get a divorce? Okay, cool, I'll just run away, go live a nice, happy life somewhere else. By myself. <laughs> yeah, by myself, I'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Like you just kind of turn it on its head, make it a little bit funny if you can, mm. you know, I think that helps a lot because it's so horrible. Um, so yeah, I think turning on its head, um, that's a, it's good practical advice and learning your values, staying value driven regardless of how anxious you might be feeling and doing it anyway and say, mm. look, okay, uh, so for example, if you do have a relationship with OCD or if you're listening to this and you have that, mm. um, like, okay, I'll stay in this, I'll stay in this for three more months and I'll see how I am then. And then I'll just go <laughs> and just go along yeah. with it. And then, then, then the next three months, say, okay, next three months, I'll just go along with it and see how it is. And eventually even six months <laughs> and yeah. you've yeah. kind of placated the anxiety to like not make a decision right now. Um, wow. yeah. so yeah, I think that was very helpful for me. Yeah. It sounds really, really powerful in terms of getting in a different mindset or, um, rationale or headspace where you're able to move on, even if it's just temporary. Y- yes, and then like you're saying, yeah. you're finding you're three months, six months down the line where you haven't repeated that particular action or whatever it might be. Yeah. It's a bully. It, it wants you to feel horrible. And I think remembering that and remembering that actually, you know, you do have the power to work with this it's okay, it can't force mm. you to do anything, it will mm. tell you that you need to do something, but it, it won't. It can't force you, it's just a bully. So you just need to like, you just need to work with it, and you just kind of bring out this sort of sassy side to you that you just you need to work with it. <laughs> you just have to, even if you fake it till you make it, mm. and that that's what helped, and Amazing. it, yeah, eventually it does help. Yeah, no, that <laughs> sounds fantastic. Um, a really kind of good way to, to manage day to day. I guess we're coming towards the end, but I wanted yeah. to, uh, ask a little bit more just about the work that you do with the Lantern Initiative sure. the kind of projects that you do I know that you're based in Peterborough so um, I wonder if we could sort of close on um, some of the projects that you've been a part of mm-hmm. anything really that you wanted to share any learnings or reflections that you wanted to share with from some of the projects or events that you've that you've been a part of yeah sure um so Lantern we do various different things actually so we have a um Chatting chat on Mondays with just women. It's mostly women focused because we're women mostly in the in the charity. Um, we do free counselling, so we signpost people to a therapist, which um, we pay for. Um, and we do connecting mums, connecting Muslim mums, which is fantastic. It's a six week course for new mums, and I'm usually there to take care of their little ones or make tea and coffee and things like that. Um, and um, we do so much more. Oh, we do retreats sometimes, so we have one upcoming with um, with the Sark. Um In fact, I think it might actually be this weekend. I wasn't involved with that. Um, and uh, yeah, we do we do workshops and things. And um, I go into schools as well and talk about mental health. And Amazing. we have things coming up talking about OCD and ADHD actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, lots of different things. It's very varied. And um, yeah, mm. we've done qigong as well, which has been great. What's this? Um, qigong exercise, like oh. slow exercise for um, uh, everybody actually. So we have aunties coming in and they just sit on their chairs and they do some exercise right at the front and it's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, it yeah. sounds excellent because it's about getting the community together yeah. and getting people to talk as well. Exactly. It and get feels, to know each other. Yeah, and, and it feels really nice when you do have at each of these events we see people different people connecting different mm. people attending and it's so nice to see people uh celebrate actually their mental health and what they're achieving and it might not be an actual conversation about how they like how they're really feeling but mm. we know that they feel better after these events because of the feedback we get so it's a small drop in the ocean and we only hope to grow inshallah so um inshallah good luck with all the projects they sound fantastic and we wish you all the best in the future with with all of your work uh uh you know with with lantern and and also ocd intrusive thoughts all of that thank you very much thank you so much saying that for being so honest and candid and really opening up um inshallah we'll see you again thank you for having me thank you very much thank you Jazakallah khair for watching this episode of the Mindful Muslim podcast with Zainab. I hope you found it a useful one. Inshallah, share this episode with friends and family. And I will see you on the next one.